Today I'm going to go over one of these circulating concepts that basically these GLP-1 medicines should be in the water because they treat basically everything and they're a miracle drug. I'm Dr. Spencer Nadelsky, a triple board certified obesity specialist physician who has overseen thousands of patients on these medicines and tens of thousands of people on the GLP-1 medicines if you include the doctors I oversaw at the various clinics I've been at. My friend, Dr. Mike Isratel, a famous YouTuber, you might have heard of him, made this post on Instagram. My wacky but evidence-based opinion, most adults should consider taking terzepatide, even if they aren't overweight. Its non-weight mediated health benefits are massive. Most people will be healthier on it than off of it. I'm gonna pick this apart and argue against it but then I'm going to what I call steel man argument this. I'm gonna give it the most charitable uh, position and then argue for it. The biggest issue I have with this statement is the combination of the term evidence-based along with the fact that he's advocating for people to take this even when not overweight. Had he removed that part about not being overweight, this actually could be considered an evidence-based statement. This is simply because most adults in the United States have overweight or obesity. These drugs have been significantly studied in that population and shown to have massive health improvement outcomes. When you look at all the trials pitting this drug, specifically terzepatide, against a placebo in a phase three randomized trial, the populations are either type two diabetes or those with overweight and obesity. What we don't know is if normal weight folks that are stark healthy who take these medicines actually confer a major benefit. Now you know that I'm a GLP-1 shill, I talk about all the risks all the time, and the risks are relatively low. However, the risk isn't zero. So if we don't know if there are benefits at a normal weight who are in people who are stark healthy, then those risks that are relatively rare and low become magnified and outweigh the little bit of clinical or no clinical benefit that we see in these individuals. The issue is we just don't know. It hasn't been studied. Had he changed this to just say my wacky opinion or my wacky hypothesis, yeah, that's reasonable. But when you add that evidence-based approach, when we don't actually have the evidence in people that aren't overweight or have that type 2 diabetes condition, we really are in an evidence-free zone. Now I'm going to steel man this argument. And essentially what the definition is, is first constructing the strongest, most compelling version of that viewpoint before offering the counter arguments or criticism. I already gave all the criticisms, so now I'm going to actually steel man this. This is the opposite of what's called a straw man argument, which is basically misrepresenting what somebody said. I don't think I straw manned his argument. I tried to take it word for word and really take it at face value. Now in order to do this, you have to actually look at people that don't have overweight. They don't seem to have an elevated BMI or markers of excess adiposity, but they actually have issues that arise from excess. To actually understand how to do this, you have to understand the concept of what is clinical obesity. Somebody could have a normal BMI and look like they don't have much body fat, but they are actually having signs of clinical obesity. And what this means is having harm from excess adiposity or excess fat tissue, despite having a normal body habitus according to a BMI or a body max index. Right now, the definition of overweight with a BMI is just that 25 to just under 30 body mass index or kilograms per meter square. A research group that I had on my podcast recently, we went over how people that appear to have a normal weight, they don't have overweight, as suggested in Dr. Isratel's post, there are plenty of people that actually have clinical obesity or harm from excess adipose tissue or fat tissue. And if you look at his statement, he's actually saying most, not all. So that actually helps this viewpoint because if you say most people, that could get all the people that actually have overweight or obesity, which is the majority of the population in the United States. And then you just start adding more people that don't have overweight, but they do have clinical obesity. Then you start getting into, yeah, I guess this makes sense, but I'm gonna go a step further. My hypothesis is that most people actually will be on these medicines in some form or fashion in the future. I think it's a distant future, but we're starting to see the benefits start right now. I'm gonna go over the things that I hypothesize we're gonna see these things used for that I'm seeing anecdotally in the clinic and actually have some publications for and some viral TikTok videos of all things 
uh, because other people have noticed the same thing. Now, these are conditions where you don't necessarily have to have that clinical obesity even without the overweight. So this goes a step further beyond even what we were just talking about. So number one, alcohol use disorder. Early on, when terzepatide came out in the form of Manjaro, a lot of us were using it off-label. This means using not according to the label. It was only approved for type 2 diabetes, but we were using it a lot for obesity because the trials for obesity were already out, even though it wasn't yet FDA label for that indication. Right away, my patients who had potential alcohol use issues were saying right away that they were not craving or even at all wanting any more alcohol. It was bizarre. So I actually posted about this on TikTok early on in the early 2020s, and some of those videos went viral because all sorts of people said, you know what, I noticed the same thing. I actually looked back at our clinic data and found that there was indeed a signal for people lowering their alcohol use. And now there are actual randomized trials going on looking at these medicines and showing potential benefit. I was trying to look at the epidemiology and the prevalence of alcohol use disorder in people that don't actually have overweight obesity, but there are plenty of people that clearly do not have that overweight or obesity or clinical obesity who have alcohol use disorder. While it's not approved for this, I do know of addiction doctors using it for this, and of course I see it in my patients. I don't personally prescribe it for this indication only. Obviously, if my patients have overweight or obesity and have that, I obviously monitor them closely and do see a benefit. Again, there needs to be more randomized trials, but there is one randomized trial looking at a low dose of semaglutide and showing some benefit there. This drug, terzepatide specifically, in my clinical experience, is more powerful than any of the drugs that are used for binge eating disorders. This includes SSRIs, topiramate, and Vyvanse. There are studies ongoing right now, and of course, it's easy to use in those with obesity and binge eating disorder, but I think what we're probably gonna see are lower doses, seeing if people that don't have that obesity, again, these studies haven't been done, but I bet they will be done, and I bet we're going to see benefit. The next one is PCOS, or polycystic ovarian syndrome. Now, this is an endocrine disorder a lot of people associate with overweight and obesity, but there are women who have PCOS who do not have obesity or overweight. They have this lean PCOS phenotype. I'm seeing all sorts of non-weight mediated benefits in patients with PCOS. They hadn't even lost weight. They, they're not eating fewer calories. They're not losing any weight, but they're noticing improvements in their cycles and other components of the PCOS symptoms. They will have to do trials in those with PCOS and no overweight and obesity. I think we're going to see massive improvements in autoimmune inflammatory disorders, things like rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, Crohn's, and ulcerative colitis. I've had patients with all of these types of conditions and seen massive improvements. Now, again, these patients all have had overweight or obesity, but a lot of them didn't even lose any weight and noticed right away after taking the medicine improvements in their pain and just overall feeling unwell. I have lots of anecdotes about patients taking their biologics for these various inflammatory disorders, and then the only improvement that they got was when they started terzepatide. So I looked this up, and I couldn't find any trials that are ongoing in people without overweight or obesity. So again, they would have to do these trials in people without that to see if there's a benefit beyond the weight loss. But I bet there is, if I had to guess. Lastly, I think this drug is going to be used for cardiovascular disease secondary prevention, meaning they've already had a heart attack or some sort of event, and we're trying to prevent the second one. But I also think we're going to see it primary prevention, meaning preventing the first heart attack. And I think we're going to see benefit there. We see these drugs have a benefit in those with type 2 diabetes and a history of cardiovascular disease or high risk of cardiovascular disease. We also see a benefit in those with obesity. The next step is to basically use them in lean individuals, people without overweight and obesity, who are at a higher risk of cardiovascular disease and see if it prevents those heart attacks. And I believe we will. So you might be saying, so wait, should everybody just be taking these medicines? And my answer is, let's be cautious, but optimistic. I do not recommend these medicines in people that don't have proper indications. Now, having said that, I have a lot of people with overweight and obesity that have these other indications, and we are absolutely using these medicines. I don't think it's wrong to even consider using them off label for potentially some of these autoimmune inflammatory disorders, but I probably wouldn't do that just at this moment. It's something to discuss with your doctor. One of the issues is if you are lean, you don't have excess adipose tissue, no overweight obesity, no clinical or preclinical obesity or anything like that, you're going to have to use subtherapeutic doses. And we don't know if those subtherapeutic micro doses, as people call them, have the benefit that we're seeing with our patients with obesity that are at these higher doses. This is exactly why we don't need the exaggerations or hype. We need data and caution. 
I've been interviewed for different magazines and podcasts and talking about the future. And I actually think one of the best case uses for these medicines is for preventing obesity and the complications in the future. Let's say you have a strong family history of obesity and obesity related complications. And right now you don't have obesity you're going through life but you start noticing your weight starting to creep up your mom and dad started developing type 2 diabetes and all sorts of complications from their excess weight mid life to later of life and you're saying oh gosh i don't want to go in that direction but you can't stop the weight gain despite your lifestyle actions should we just wait till someone develops obesity and the obesity related complications well it might be a good use case to say let's give you a small dose and just prevent it in the first place that's where i think these things are going to be used now i personally don't take one of these medicines everybody's like you think these things are so great then why don't you take it yourself i don't have an indication i have a lot of food noise i think about shawarma i think about chips all sorts of things all the time but you know i'm a pretty lean and active individual i have hashimoto's maybe there'll be some benefit there but at this moment i am not taking one of these medicines and i wouldn't recommend it because there is no indication is it possible that i take one in the near future probably not the near future but i see a distant future if we get some more data saying hey these things are going to prevent a heart attack in you even though you're pretty lean and healthy so all this is saying I don't think we should be recommending most people take these medicines just yet. I do see a future where that is very possible. I think what we need to do is get the evidence to be able to say this is an evidence-based opinion to be able to do so. But I could see this future uh, coming up. Now, if you have overweight and obesity and want to look into using these medicines with the best team out there, you may want to consider joining my clinic that's online. We're in all 50 states. We have an amazing team with dietitians who make sure that you do it in a way that's not going to harm you. If you like this nuanced conversation, make sure you subscribe to my channel and send this to a friend who may enjoy this as well.